Hello, Nonprofit Quarterly Community. It's great to see you. Uh, welcome to this webinar called Turning a Core Competence into Reliable Earned Revenue. I'm Jean Bell with the Nonprofit Quarterly. I direct an effort called Advancing Practice, of which this session is a part. We're delighted you're with us. Uh, before I go any further, you see a sponsor uh, logo on the bottom of the slide there, and I want to lift up the sponsorship that allows us to bring this session to you at no cost to you. It's from MIP Fund Accounting by Community Brands. And it's a fund accounting software of choice for nonprofit and government organizations. MIP lets you track by fund, manage restrictions based on unlimited funding sources, and meet complex reporting requirements. Whether in the cloud or on premises, MIP and its end to end suite of functionality and multi segment chart of accounts adapt to the size and unique needs of your organization. As an industry leader since 1982, MIP is purpose built to meet the ever changing needs of the modern nonprofit. Community Brands is the leading provider of cloud-based software to associations, nonprofits, faith-based groups, and K-12 schools. On a personal note, I can tell you that many years ago, I learned accounting on MIP. So if a non-finance person can learn on it, it's also a good tool uh, for the emerging finance leader. So we're very grateful for that sponsorship. You also see a hashtag, Core Confidence, on that slide. Those of you who use social media, we'd love for you to join this conversation. It's actually part of an ongoing conversation at MTQ about advancing practice around business models. So use that hashtag if you're talking about what you're learning and thinking about today. So now I want to introduce Jamie Millard. Uh, Jamie Millard is the Executive Director of Pollen. You're going to learn a lot more about her organization in a moment, but just to get you grounded, Pollen is a community of 10,000 plus civic connectors across Minneapolis and St. Paul. Pollen invests in human connection through storytelling, bringing people together through events, and linking people to new personal and professional opportunities. And we're going to learn how she turned that premise into a really strong earned revenue strategy in a moment. But something else to know that's notable about Jamie's bio is she has a lot of these kind of titles in it. 40 under 40, 100 people to know, um, industry leader. So we're not the only ones that have recognized uh, the interesting story and progress you've made in, in um, building an earned revenue strategy. And we're really excited to bring that story to this national platform. Um, so Jamie, I'm going to turn it over to you. And as you think of questions, participants, you can use the chat box to write those in. I'll be monitoring those. Uh, we're going to let Jamie just walk through this presentation, which is really only about half of our time together. Um, and then I will start posing those questions to her. But feel free to chat them in as they come to you. And then we'll have a rich time for dialogue after your presentation, Jamie, because we know a lot of people participating are thinking about either sharpening an earned revenue strategy or adding one. So next slide, and let me turn it over to you, Jamie. Thank you so much, Jean. Uh, I really appreciate that introduction, and I'm very grateful to Nonprofit Quarterly for inviting myself and Pollen to share our story. And uh, this journey that Pollen has been on towards seeking earned revenue has been quite the journey. This presentation is kind of a beginning, middle, and now where Pollen is at. And before I dive in, I do want to just give everybody a little bit more context on myself. I am an accidental nonprofit executive director. Show of hands, who else here um, can relate to that? Uh, with that, we're a small team. So Pollen, our organization is under a million dollars. We have uh, five full-time staff, a few part-time staff, but we work with lots of 1099 contractors a year. So we're a tiny team. With that, I'm also the finance director, CFO, uh, you know, doing all that. So I feel for anyone else in that position too. Um, my background though is in literature, it's in storytelling, it's in arts. I'm an English major, and I care deeply about the ways that stories can transform connection-driven experiences, which is really the heart of what Pollen does, and I'm going to spend more time there, too. In addition to all the nonprofit hats that I wear, I'm also a mother. I have a four-year-old and a four-month-old, so if at any point I go off the rails, please, I just blame all my sleep deprivation uh, that's leading to that, which I'm blaming on everything right now in my life. So. That's me. Here's my Twitter handle, at JJ Millard. Feel free to, if you have any questions um, beyond this webinar, feel free to reach out. I just have so much love for anyone else also on an earned revenue journey, and we can cry in the corner together. So that's me. Um, now, next slide, and I'll talk a little bit more about my organization, Pollen. We are a media arts organization and we foster our main, our biggest goals are to foster empathy, to encourage connection across difference, ultimately to inspire meaningful action. 
We do that through sharing the stories of individuals who are trying to change our collective story for the better. So we have a membership. We have you know, 10,000 individuals across Minneapolis and St. Paul and Minnesota that um, use our services, read our stories, come to the events that we host, um, that look to us as a place that is informing the topics around some of the biggest social justice issues of our time. So I'll dig in. So you can, again, there's our Twitter handle, Pollen Midwest. And our website is pollenmidwest.org. And I'll talk a little bit more about our programming because I think it's going to really, it's an important foundation for how we developed our earned revenue strategy. So if you go to the next slide, you can see this is our one of our core programming in the way that we foster empathy or encourage connection across difference and help inspire meaningful action. We do that through narrative storytelling. We feature stories on individuals who are committed to defending our shared humanity. We explore the community's most pressing issues through the human eyes most impacted by those challenges. Those working towards the solutions on these biggest social justice issues. And we really believe that through the individual story, through the movements that these individuals are creating, that we can begin to understand ourselves a little bit better and each other. So that's the narrative storytelling that we do. We are so, like I said, English major at heart, almost everyone else on our staff is too. We care deeply about the transformative nature of stories and solving some of our biggest social justice issues. If you go to the next slide, another way that our programming manifests is through connection-driven experiences. So our storytelling is happening on our website. It's a digital reading experience. And then we bring that digital reading experience in person through connection events. So we have 10,000 members. A lot of those members like to show up and interact with us in events. These are not networking events, though. They are multimedia story-driven events that bring the power of people together through narrative explorations that tackle some of those thorny issues that our stories are also tackling. Yes, a lot of networking happens because when you're in a space that is um, getting deep and going vulnerable and exploring tough issues in a professional setting, you're able to connect with people who are not like yourself at a much deeper level. So our events are narrative experiences. We care deeply about the role of design and art and visuals as a form of communication to unlock um, transcendent experiences that help us connect across difference and help us feel inspired to take meaningful action. So those are that's kind of the core programming of Pollen's mission. The way that we foster empathy, the way that we're connecting across difference is through our narrative storytelling and our event-driven experiences. So that's pollen as we are today. Um, if you go to the next slide, some of the grounding that I'm going to walk everyone through is our founding history. So we were founded in 2009, and we started out as a really simple e-newsletter. So we look very different today than we did 10 years ago. Uh, we were this e-newsletter. It wasn't even designed. It was just a big list of things happening in the Minneapolis, St. Paul, kind of this community. It was jobs, it was events, it was opportunities to take action in your community. It was coming right after the um, recession of 2008 and people were really in a time of transition. People were looking for their what's next. And Pollen became a way that was just a curated list of great civic things to get engaged in, but it was very much kind of a community bulletin. It was all volunteer run. There was zero budget. It was founded by our um, Lars Lee Flad, who is our founder. I highly recommend you check him out on Twitter too, at Lars Lee Flad. He's um, an incredible connector in the civic space. And I became a volunteer with Pollen in 2011, just as somebody who I was getting these emails and I was getting felt plugged into community from it. So I just volunteered with Pollen and Lars and helped put together these emails, but I can't emphasize there was just no, I mean, we all had full-time jobs. It was volunteer run. We didn't, we didn't even have a website for a while. Finally, I built a website for Pollen on Squarespace. I mean, it was just very, um, it was a, it was very little infrastructure. And so that was 2009. And then if you go to the next slide, um, some years went by and then in 2013, so I started volunteering with Pollen in 2011, along with um, my uh, other business partner, Megan Murphy. So her and I were both running a literary arts magazine at the time. And Megan and I were volunteering with Pollen and starting to invest in, you know, trying to, you know, build the website for it, trying to add a little bit more robustness to it, but still as volunteers. And then in 2013, so we've been volunteering with Pollen for two years, uh, this crazy thing happened and we received a one and a half million dollar unrestricted three-year operating grant. We did not, I can't even tell you what a weird windfall of an experience this was because we did not 
apply for this opportunity. We were approached by a local foundation who was looking to invest in grassroots community connection driven um, work and identified pollen as a, a hotbed for that and wanted to take a big bet on what it would look like to invest in pollen at that level and see what it, what would happen if we took it to the next level. And Megan and I said, yes, we are game. Let's, let's do that. Let's figure this out. Um, but again, the vision was not, we weren't actively manifesting towards operationalizing pollen, but once we received that grant, um, it was go, go, go. We quit our other full-time jobs. We started working full-time for pollen, started to build and invest in what um, this next era of pollen would look like. And in our community, our local nonprofit landscape, when you get that kind of investment, there's a lot of um, kind of eyes and eyes are on you about what, what are you gonna do with those kinds of resources? And um, we felt a lot of pressure on that. One of the things, you know, having been an English major and now transitioning into this one and a half million dollar grant and trying to figure out how do we hire staff? What does the future of this organization look like? Um, if we can click to the next slide, one of the things that I really wanna underemphasize for us is this is what our revenue pie chart looked like. And I was an English major, had no managing director experience. I was 26 years old. And I just, I knew though, I knew enough to know that this was not a good revenue pie chart, that your pie chart should not be one color and that it probably should have more colors in it to show your revenue sources. And from the beginning, um, I could see this cliff coming. You know, what happens when we don't have a business model, we've been all volunteer run, what happens when this three year grant is over? And how do we start trying to back our way into a business model? So if you go to the next slide, the, this is a phase of building for us. Um, when you get that kind of investment, um, you, get, you want to produce the best work. And we really wanted to invest in the quality of our programming. And we had three years of unrestricted revenue where we didn't have to think about how are we going to pay for to do all this stuff. We had the we had the investment, we had the resources. We weren't having to chase any money, and we were able to take that luxury and build incredibly quality-driven programming. We were able to refine our work. We are able to fully invest in being excellent at everything that we did. And in that process of being able to be fully invested in our core competencies of storytelling and these connection driven events, we became known as producing some of the best storytelling and event experiences. And I don't know if that would have been such a quick thing, if that kind of expertise would have been so quick without that unrestricted, you know, just having the security of that kind of investment that we received. But it did allow us to build just exceptionally excellent programming and it raised the bar for it in a lot of ways of what storytelling can look like for nonprofits, what event experiences can look like in the social sector. And so if we go to the next slide, um, the other thing that was happening in this, so yes, we're investing in the programming, we're getting it right, we're doing these beautiful stories, we're doing beautiful events, and we're starting to know we need to build a business plan. And as we were looking into what does a business plan look like for an organization that has never had a business plan before, has no revenue drivers, we explored lots of different things. Do we do paid membership? We have all these members. Um, there, it's a free membership is our model. We have all these members. Do we start charging for membership? Um, we felt really uncomfortable about that because Pollen had always been free. And now that we get this one and a half million dollar investment, now we're going to start charging our members for um, to be a part of it. It felt it didn't feel it didn't it didn't feel right. Um, but we looked into it. We looked into growing event revenue from our events. We looked into advertising on our website because we were doing the storytelling. We looked into, do we start an individual donor program? Do we invest in more contributed philanthropy with other grants? Do we try and um, pursue a grant making strategy? You name it, we had a 17 pillar business plan exploration process document that we were working through. And it was exhaustive and it was hard to try and figure that out while you're building the programming. And if we go to the next slide, in the meantime, this other thing started happening where we're pursuing this business planning and all of our, a lot, so many of our nonprofit peers were coming to us and saying, hey, can we hire Pollen to do storytelling for us? We love these stories that Pollen is producing. 
can we hire you to do that for us? And this was really, so we got the grant in 2013 and all of this, can we hire Paul and was happening in 2014. And over and over we said, no, no, we don't do that for other nonprofits. We do storytelling for us. We do events for us. We're not going to do that for you. Why would we, that's what we do. That's what we want to be known for. Why would we want to share our secret sauce and our specialness with others? It, you know, it felt, it felt it was a, such a strange question, but it just kept happening. And finally, uh, we started to listen to that, um, that question. So if you go to the next slide, this was the really big light bulb moment was I think it was probably we'd been asked, I don't know, 10 times, 15 times if other people could hire Paul and to do storytelling for them. And finally we thought, oh, okay, maybe, maybe we can do that. Maybe we can do our core mission work of storytelling and engagement, but for other mission driven organizations, for other nonprofits or foundations. And maybe there's a way that that's actually not taking away from what we do, but it's expanding our mission reach and it's generating revenue. So if we do a story on, if Pollen is doing a story on the housing crisis, what is the difference between us doing that story for ourselves versus bringing our methodology and expertise of storytelling to Minnesota Department of Homelessness to for them to do a housing story? So we started to see that this could actually be a way for us to just expand our core competency, but generate revenue in the process and if you go to the next slide this really gets at the once we had the like okay yeah maybe we can do that for you then we got into a lot of it was just all right let's let's try it you know it was a lot of experimenting we were piloting 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 and i will say it was not a intentional process so we were not um, like, okay, let's do a landscape scan and see what the market opportunity is. And let's put a business model together for this and know exactly what our pricing should be. And here's our target kind of clients that we would want to work with. And here's, you know, the profitability of each project needs to be this. It was not sophisticated like that at all. It was very much fast iterative. Yes, we'll try that. Okay, that failed. That was a horrible experiment. What did we learn from it? Okay, let's try this one. That one went really good. Why did that one go so great? Let's try and do more of that. Um, it was very simple and extremely organic, and but it was a rapid fire piloting process that happened for a few years. And if you go to the next slide, one of the things that um, during this testing time period was really about three years. And it took us that full three years to figure out the pricing, to figure out what we were good at, to figure out what were our capabilities, to determine who are the right types of nonprofits or foundations that make for ideal audiences for us. And those slow learnings developed, worked themselves into a business plan, but we absolutely learned by doing. And I just want to pause here because I think this process of the like, okay, I think we have an idea. I think this could be earned revenue, but how do we actually turn it into a business line can look so different for every organization. And it's really important to understand what is the, culture and way that your organization operates to go about that process. Are you the kind of organization that has the resources or time to be very intentional about that? Take a step back. Maybe you could hire a consultant to do these things for you before you actually start doing the projects or start generating the revenue. Um, we were we were kind of cart before the horse. We were backwards on that. We started generating, doing the projects and doing the revenue and then learned through that by doing um, how to turn it into a business. And I've seen it done so many different ways. And I think just understanding what is that right process and where are you at for that is an important piece in helping to know um, to get it right. And there's just not a right way to do it. You know, I don't know that Paul and when it would have been able to figure out an earned revenue strategy if we had tried to be super intentional about it. If we had tried to say, um, here, you know, if we were hyper strategic about it, I don't know that it would have worked for us. Um, we, it was, it was in the learning of the doing each project that really helped us understand that this would be a scalable revenue generator for us. And so that's just a tricky, that was a tricky thing. Um, and I, maybe there's questions that we can dig into that piece of it a little bit more, but now, you know, we took that three years to test and to learn by doing. And if you go to the next slide, um, 2018, is when things get really exciting. So March of 2018, we officially launched Pollen Studio. And we were really clear when we were ready to launch that we are what we're really good at um, and that we are 
invested that Pollen, just as an organization, as a nonprofit, believes in the power of art and story and engagement to wake people up, to get our communities more invested in the most important social issues of our time. And whether we're doing that kind of art and story work on Pollen work or we're doing it on our nonprofit partner projects, it doesn't matter to us. Both are equally wonderful and beautiful. One of them generates revenue that completely now funds the other side of our house. So if you go to the next slide, um, this is the launch of our earned revenue project, you know, the, our earned revenue program, our social enterprise. We call it Pollen Studio. It's embedded on our website. There's a hire us tab so people can kind of go through and see what the hiring, what it looks like to hire Pollen Studio. And we're really clear that Pollen Studio brings Pollen's core competency of narrative storytelling and engagement centered events to other mission driven organizations. This has been a very um, scalable model for us because we there's not two sides of the house we um, it's the same staff that work on pollen stories that would work on our client stories it's the same writers that we hire it's the same artists that we would hire it's you know the process for those two programs it truly is such a core competency that the only difference for us is that we need to have Pro, you know, different kinds of client relational focused project management on the Pollen Studio types of projects than we do internally. We have project management across throughout the whole organization, but we really do bring a kind of a client focused um, perspective for the Pollen Studio side of the work. But it's a, it is so core to what we do as an organization that you can just hire us to do it for you. So that's Pollen's. If you go to the next slide, the other thing that I will also say about when we launched is this is kind of a screenshot from our client list page. And we were able to launch with having piloted projects with 48 different clients. And so we weren't launching with a like, here's what we think is going to be an earned revenue strategy. We had a proven, tested, reputable um, product that we were able to launch with, with just incredible clients that had taken a chance on us during those three years that we were piloting. And a lot of times it was, I mean, big government organizations, other foundations, other really reputable, big, large nonprofits, small nonprofits that had didn't even have comms departments, you know, as you name it, but we were able to launch with a really solid footing as opposed to launching from a place of, here's what we think an earned revenue strategy is gonna be for us. I hope you'll take a chance and work with us now. So there was a lot of behind the scenes work that happened in order to make that launch the way it did and um, so that's kind of where we were launching. We launched the earned revenue in March of 2018. We immediately, um, and I'll talk some about the challenges post now having been operating for more than a full year now and the public facing aspect of having this social enterprise. But um, so that's Pollen Studio. Now, if we go to the next slide, one of the things that um, I think is helpful to talk about um, it's kind of like how to see this changing business model happening, how to know that there is a cliff coming in your um, business that could make you, you know, think about like turning a core competency into a revenue, um, you know, earned revenue model. Um, realizing that the unknown in that is extremely scary, that you're absolutely building two businesses simultaneously. And I think this piece that relevancy means change. So if you want to stay relevant, whether you're nonprofit, for-profit, private sector, entrepreneur, you wanna be relevant, it means you're constantly looking ahead and you're constantly being adaptive and ready for change. If you go to the next slide, for us being able to see that we needed to change um, or that we were gonna to have to figure out this model was really clear. So on the left, I love this graphic. Um, it helped me not sleep at night, but if you look at the left, that's our contributed revenue. So again, we have that big grant. We had it for three years and then if you look in 2016 it doesn't take even an English major can look at this bar chart of your revenue and know that change is coming and that you need to be adaptive in your business model and you need to figure out some way to that cliff is coming and you've got to do something about it and earned revenue for us was the growth model that helped us get out of that cliff cycle that tailspin so if you go to the next slide here the thing that I want to just be really transparent and honest about is that that meant embracing a huge deficit. And you can see from that past slide what kind of deficit that that would leave, that huge drop. And we weren't able to use any of that grant for operating reserves. So this meant embracing and bracing for a four-year deficit plan, which we are still in the middle of. Um, the deficit plan started in 2017, 2018, 2019. So we're in the third year of a four-year planned budgeted deficit to intentionally invest in our growth, understanding and realizing that transitions take time. You know, if 
we had expected this new model to immediately make up for um, that change in our business model, then it wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been prepared for reality. And we would have, um, you know, it would have looked more like failure than success. But if you are a director managing through deficits, again, we can cry in the corner together. We can start a support network. It's such a hard space to be in. Um, but it really does help knowing that it's this plan and you have to kind of reevaluate what your success markers look like. So um, for me, you know, success might not be surplus every month, but I have other micro uh, goals that I'm hitting that I know are going to get me out of that. And I started doing this four-year budget planning right away. So I think my first four-year budget was in 20. 16 uh, or not 2016 uh, 2014 was my first year of putting together a four-year budget and now that's my practice so every you know I'm always I don't build an annual budget I'm building a four to five year financial overview that help it's helping me forecast to stay in tune to that relevancy to stay um, to see how that business model is continually adapting and evolving and now we're in a place where if you go to this next slide here um, which is one of the things that I'm really proud of is it looks that pie chart, now we have so many more beautiful colors to our pie chart, pie chart than we did in 2016, 2013, where it was just one source of revenue. We have seven different sources of, you know, these revenue streams. They're diverse, but they're really compatible. So I don't feel like we're running seven different businesses. That would be impossible to manage. But I've been really trying to narrow in on our diversification of revenue because I never want to be in that place again where I have one source of revenue coming from such a large um, such a large source. And even within these streams, uh, for Pollen Studio, for example, that's almost half of our revenue, but there's 15 different sources within Pollen Studio. We don't have one flagship client. We have 15 plus different clients a year that we're working with so that it's even diversified within those revenue streams. Um, we've baked earned revenue for Pollen across a lot of our programs. So about 70, almost 75% of all of Pollen's revenue now is earned revenue coming from event ticket sales, Pollen Studio, sponsored content, um, you know we have a jobs board where there's a paid component to that so there's a lot of earned revenue baked in and making you know less percentage of our pie is um, dependent and connected to contributed philanthropy which is just the right it's the right mix and right fit for pollen so if you go to the next slide one of the um kind of underlining things through all of this that you can't navigate any kind of change in your business model without understanding the culture of your organization and being laser focused on creating a supportive and um, caring culture because it is so hard to come through onto the other side of a new business model and you really need to understand do you have the right people on your team so do you have people that thrive during change do you and what does that even mean what is it like what does, that would be such a great conversation to have with your team on how do they personally in their personal lives weather change what how does that show how does that kind of stress show up for them do they make decisions from a place of fear um you can't you can't make decision fear-based decision making during this kind of evolution you have to be you have to throw away that fear and you have to instead embrace opportunity and possibility and you have to have kind of a i always think of like my job as the director in this is to have a rally cry energy so that i'm it's always like the captain of captain you know we can do this you know the positive force the 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 everything's possible like ah let's go together and i think it's so important for morale boosting to have somebody that is thinking through that rally of the team and to understand that culture is absolutely not top down. I think a lot of times we think that it's top down, but really great leaders can make space for culture to be bottom up and that we can see anybody on our team as somebody who can help shape and support each other and to build a really supportive culture. So we've had, Pollen has had almost no turnover in this past uh, five, six years that we've been doing this, which is remarkable considering how much change and difficulty that we've weathered. I and mean, I really think that is because we have this mindset of mothering one another and supporting each other. Um, do you have the right board on place? This is a whole other webinar about boards and making sure that you have the right board in place to support a business model. But sometimes you have to invite board members to end their service if it's not aligning with the vision of where the organization is going through a change. Um, I think that it's important to make sure that you have board members with competency around the new model. So we absolutely have, you know, uh, creative agency for-profit minds on our board that really understand service and clients and pipeline and that kind of thinking in addition to being very connected to our mission. 
um, so that's all, that's all I have to say about culture. It's super important to make sure that your, um, your board and your staff are in a place of trust and optimism and belief in what's possible as opposed to coming from a place of doubt or concern or negative questioning. Uh, it's not helpful. So if you go to the next slide, one of the things that I'll end on here before we get into kind of my big takeaways and hopefully have some time for questions is where's pollen going from here? We've been uh, launched for you know over a year now. It's making up pollen studio. Our earned revenue strategy is making up about half of our revenue. Right now we are in a place of challenges of growth. You know, I had been very prepared for what happens when we launch and it nobody called the phone stops ringing we don't get any work we're tail spinning like i had been thinking through kind of the uh worst case scenarios and i uh, i've needed to think focus more on best case scenarios and i'm grateful that i had some fantastic board members who are always you know helping me like jamie this could go this could like really blow up like we need to be thinking about that and so we are now in a phase of trying to understand that there are huge challenges that come with growth. How do we invest in our growth? What does it look like to have a line of credit where we are um, coming from a place of financial strength to invest in our growth, um, as opposed to using a line of credit to make payroll? You know, we're not in that um, situation, which I'm grateful for, but I um, was underprepared for the kind of capacity planning so that we can be in a position to say yes, and as opposed to like, oh my gosh, we don't have the staff capacity for that because I don't want to drive our team into the ground. I don't want people to feel like they have two full-time jobs. You know, we need to really make sure that we are investing in the expense that it takes to build a new and robust program. So that's where we are right now. Um, we have a lot of challenges to figure out for that. The board is deeply engaged in that work. Um, we constantly talk about it at the staff level and, um, but, so that's where that's where Pollen is now. A year on the other side of having turned that core competency into our big earned revenue cash cow that is completely subsidizing the rest of the organization. And the other thing that I'll add on this is that we are the question that I ask myself often with having an earned revenue strategy is how big does it need to grow? Do uh, does Pollen Studio just grow because it can grow? Could it be a two million dollar line of business? Maybe. Do, does pollen need it to be? I'm not sure. And the best way I think to understand that dynamic is what is your earned revenue subsidizing and how big is that deficit gap? So if we're using pollen studios profit margins to subsidize the storytelling and event experiences that pollen is doing as a nonprofit, how many of those programs do we want to do? What is the deficit of that program? Because that program's not um, at a place of surplus, and we're using the profits, the surplus from Pollen Studio to subsidize that deficit. And that's really the uh, equation that we have to figure out on how big Pollen Studio should get, is what is that surplus, um, that deficit that the surplus is funding. And that's kind of the growth planning work of the board right now, and it's so much fun. Um, I, I, you know, this little English major is understanding and enjoying this much more than I was five years ago, that's for sure. Um, so just to wrap up all of that, you go to the, uh, my final slide here is uh, around some of my biggest takeaways in developing that earned income strategy is number one, just taking advantage of what you already know. You know, we weren't, we were just doing what we already did great for other people and getting paid for it. We weren't developing an entirely new way of doing something that we didn't know, already know how to do. So we were taking advantage of what we already know. Um, we've been relentless about surrounding ourselves with smart people, not only on our team, but smart partnerships, people who trust us, people who were willing to take a risk and a chance on us before we had officially launched Pollen Studio and some of those projects. And uh, this third one around finding startup capital, I think is so important and we need to talk more about, um, and foundations and funders can talk more about this too. Um, if you're trying to evolve your business model, and um, develop a new way of earning revenue, which is developing a new business model. We have to fund that. It takes capital. We had an unrestricted three-year grant from a local foundation that helped fund that. Uh, that's a huge, the, what that has done. You know how you have to answer that question on grants, like how are you gonna make this a sustainable, you know, affluent, you know, a sustainable investment and not come back and ask us for more money next year? Funding startup capital to invest in this kind of revenue development is one way that we as organizations can really start to 
be more free with our thinking, maybe we have to invest that in ourselves with a line of credit. Maybe we have to use our reserve to do that, but it absolutely takes capital. And then this um, final note here, which I absolutely think is by far the most important of everything is loving and take caring of your people. Um, it's important that we have renewal built into the way that our, um, that the way that we create, that we have, that we are well paid, that we have time off, significant amount of time off to spend time with our family and connecting with um, our values and that we connect as a team. You know, our, I always joke that the second biggest line item with expense at Pollen is staff food, you know, us ordering food together, eating lunches together, spending dinners together, um, just thinking about what does it look like to have a matriarchal culture. That's a, my language that I use here for Pollen, but thinking through the way that we love and take care of our team and how that is a collective um, atmosphere. So those are my four biggest takeaways. Um, I could just keep going on and on. I feel like that was a whirlwind, but I'm happy to dive in now to some questions. Jamie, thank you. There's so much insight and entrepreneurial kind of spirit in that. We have a lot of questions, so thank you for uh, keeping it to the what you projected, because we were going to use these full 25 minutes to talk about people's questions. Let's first talk about just tech, a couple of quick technical issues. Pollen is part of the 501c3 structure. Yep. It's not a separate business. Yeah, same board. Everything is 501c3. Okay. Pollen Studio is just its own cost center. Got it. And there aren't, therefore, tax implications because this is your mission-focused work? Absolutely. There is no, I think this question is getting at UBIT, Unrelated Business Income yep. Tax, is our core mission right. work that we are just earning revenue for. Um, so I think that it's, you know, an understanding of UBIT or any of that is really critical. It's one of the number one things that come up when people start to develop social enterprise or here earning money. Um, there's a, a lot of fear mongering around um, unrelated business income tax. And so in the very early days of Pollen Studio, I had to do a lot of educating with my board of directors and we banned UBIT from being talked about. Like we were like, we put that to bed now, move forward. This is core mission work that we're just earning money on. Fantastic. Great. So now there's a lot of questions about pricing, what it was like to begin charging other nonprofits. Did you use a sliding scale? Did you, did you stop? doing free events? Like, how did you develop your pricing model? Oh, it was so hard. Um, we did a, so we looked at how much these services would cost in the market. So if you were going to hire an ad agency or a storytelling agency or a communications agency to do this for you, how much would that cost? And then it was really important that we did charge below market rate because we are a nonprofit. And so we looked, you know, so we are, our hourly rate is below, significantly below, probably 50% less than what our competitive for-profit um, agencies would be charging for the same kind of storytelling work. And so it's not a sliding fee model, except it is just so below market rate, um, since we are a nonprofit. And so that's a, that's a kind of how the pricing worked on our Pollen Studio side. On the event side, that's a whole other, um, a whole other earned revenue thing that I could go into and talk about. But. Okay, but let's stay on that. So I'm actually surprised by that answer. So you, you're currently purposely charging, did you say around half market rate for the quality of work you're doing? Yes. And that's built into your long-term projections, and it's yes. still generating the subsidy for the other programs. I just, can you talk a little bit more about how that's possible? Are your costs a lot yes. lower? How are you um, making that happen? I actually think that our costs are probably higher than our agency for-profit competitors. We aren't driven by the same need to have the, the, our, the profit margins that we need are much less than what our agency competitors need because we're not, you know, uh, you know I've, I've worked at an agency, like I have, you know, theory, you know, opinions about that, but so we know what we need to make to be profitable to subsidize those programs. We pay, you know, we're really clear about the expenses that it takes to make pollen, to make that work happen. I think that is one failure that happens when developing new earned revenue is not having a really smart understanding of the expenses. So you might think that it's profitable, but it's actually maybe not. So for us, mm -hmm. you know, the expenses that take it for us to do this is staff time to work on projects. But then our model is that we hire a lot of 1099 contractors, freelancing writers, practicing artists, illustrators, photographers, copy editors. We bring in a lot of teams to create this work. So we have really clear bottom line expenses that we are able to bake into the fees um, when we work with our partners. Mm -hmm. 
then we have a set of questions about philanthropy. And first of all, early on, what was the role, if any, of that major front-end capital investor in the development of your product? Since that wasn't the original plan, right? Um, and how involved were they and have they been? And do you still get money from them? So a whole set of questions uh, about their role. Yes. Yeah, so intended and then eventually what it became. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that's, that's the Bush Foundation. Um, I think that they are a leader nationally in what it looks like to partner with organizations in unrestricted um, funding to do um, the president of the foundation, Jennifer Horde Reedy, really believes in taking big bets and big risk. And um, that's absolutely what it was. It was a big bet on pollen. It was a big bet on two 26 year old young women who had never managed an organization before. If you look at how you start taking risk to do philanthropy differently, uh, that's a, a great model for it. You know, we weren't, we didn't have to even do a grant application. So I think that there is, um, there's a there's something to be said there in that risk that they took and then there was partnership throughout every step of the way so we were meeting with bush foundation sometimes monthly definitely at least quarterly to here's what we're thinking for our programming what do you think on this they made their whole team accessible to us you know a 40 plus staff team i was able to meet with their cfo regularly to review our business modeling the plan what does this look like um jennifer ford reedy was really clear from day one that you know, neither her or us, we didn't want this to be an experiment. We wanted to be able to get to a place of sustainability and stability for the organization. We didn't want, on um, you know, the next day after that three-year grant ended to be like, hey, actually we need, we need to continue the grant. You know, that wasn't the plan. We wanted to be able to use it as a startup capital to create something and to be generative and to figure out a way forward. Um, we do still receive funding from them. We receive, um, they have an ecosystem grant that lots of 40 plus different nonprofits apply for and get a year. And we are one of the grantees of that ecosystem program. So we're, and they are our only major foundation funding right now. So we have very small contributed philanthropy as part of our revenue mix. Um, but Bush Foundation is still an incredible, um, one of our main partners across all of our storytelling and event programming. Um, it's not, we weren't in incubated by them you know we were our own entity for sure but they've been just the the kind of partnership that we received from them from a funder is what i would just if i had a foundation magic wand and could wish it upon every nonprofit i know i would wish that for them um, it sounds like a like a benign venture capital framework <laughs> like a, a venture capital but with a lot of commitment to success Absolutely. and not extracting stuff in the back end and all that yeah when I, Absolutely. And Bush Foundation actually does a lot of analysis and learning from venture capitalists and social impact mm -hmm. investing. And it's, it's how they the direction that they um, that they think in for sure. Right. So we've got some questions about you mentioned that sometimes you have to invite board members out of the picture when they're not maybe not with you on where you're taking it. Um, and, and I don't know, you said there wasn't a lot of turnover at the staff level either, but we have some questions about how you were along the way assessing that commitment, assessing people's readiness to work with clients, yeah. for instance, that must have been intensifying and ongoing as it got bigger. Can you talk a little bit more about that experience for you as a leader and some of your lessons learned there? Yeah, you know, at the board level, I will just say I learned that it's so important for uh, an executive director to be continually painting a picture for the board about where the organization is going. Um, I try to use every board meeting as an opportunity to analyze that cliff. You know, analyze here's how, here's the state of the ecosystem right now for pollen and here's where it's going. Constantly, you know, and I know a lot of people believe that boards should be setting the strategic vision and that's the role of the board is to set the strategic vision. I don't quite see it that way. I really think that it's a board's role to support the staff's vision and to be, and it's our job to make sure they understand what that vision is and that they can see it. You know, we're the ones day to day that are in it. And for those first three years, every time I talked with a board member, this grant is ending. Are we prepared for this grant ending? What are we, what is the new model? That was the big strategic meaty thing that the board was working on. And they were really clear that that was their job to figure out. Um, and if at any point, once we started to narrow in on what that vision was and that earned revenue and pollen studio was gonna be the thing that could get us out of that um, hole, if a board member wasn't excited about that or didn't think that was the right direction for us, there's only so much you can go through having that person at a meeting, those people at a meeting, bringing that down. 
And so I do think that um, directors have more power in shaping the conversation at the board. We're not held hostage by these volunteers that are on our board. If we can effectively, you know, they, they should be there in partnership with us in what we're trying to build. And I needed every moment and every energy of those meetings to be going in a productive way or we didn't have time. We didn't have time to be kind of going back down. Once we was like, this is the direction we have to go, go, and everything needs to be focused on that direction. So um, I think that can was speak to, yeah. Yeah, Sorry, can you speak to what you talked about UBIT and you know that being sort of, you have to put a dollar in the jar, I have to use that term again, kind of moment at the board level. But were there other core fears, just because I think for the participants to think about what they might anticipate if board members or even staff that are currently feeling pretty aligned were to go down this process, like what, what came up from people that, that scared them or turned them off? Yeah, I mean, there is so much, um, I think there was a lot of fear around. So at the same time, we'd also been in 2015 launched an individual donor model too. Um, so we, you know, we don't, we have free, we don't have um, paid membership, but we get a lot of individual donations. And is there a fear around if we launch an earned revenue model, and people start to see pollen earning revenue to do this work that people will stop donating to pollen. Will foundations want to stop investing in us? Will, um, you know, will people, so there is a lot of discussion, I think a fear around that. And we just had to really hold firm, um, that not to go into that scarcity mindset thinking like yes we can strategically prepare our key messages and conversations for that but if we are producing great work and we are invested in our mission and we're invested in our members we believe that there is value there and to instead believe in the yes of the value as opposed to the fear of the what if that you know that that fear side so trying so hard to not give into the fear possibilities and lean into the mindset of opportunity and believing in the value that we're providing. And we haven't, you know, we spent a lot of time on that conversation and we haven't seen any lost one donor because of it. We haven't had a single foundation say, if anything, people like that we have a, you know, more lives to stand on, that it's not completely dependent on them, especially foundation partners, you know? So I think that mm -hmm. we spent a lot of time on that and, um, but I think we just had to like hold each other through it. And now that we're on the other side of it, it wasn't a big of a deal as we thought it was going to be. Thank you for that. The, the other thing I love about your story is this planned deficit thing. You know, we're, we're riding along with your story and your beautiful slides and we're thinking now they're, now they're rocking and rolling. And, and then you tell us uh, we're rocking and rolling, but it's a long game and that you have these micro goals, I think you call them, or maybe those are like lead indicators that you're for your, projection, which I'm sure is kind of rolling and chewed up as things evolve, but is still on track and that you should still be spending money at the level you are. It's still going to return that much money eventually. I don't want to drill down too much in the brief, but I'm just curious if you can give an example of one of those micro goals. But what are, what are the things, the levers, the indicators you're watching as you're playing this long game to get this thing right size? Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, this is my first time managing an organization, doing any budgets, so it's definitely my first deficit uh, plan. You know, for the first three years of my time in this director role, it was all surplus. Everything was, you know, everything was a surplus. Mm -hmm. And so um, going into the, the indicators have been really helpful for me as somebody who needs, as we all do, we are all human and we all need to feel successful in what we're doing to stay optimistic, to be able to sleep at night, to be able to come into work in the morning. And so these indicators for me have helped me understand what success looks like even in deficit years and that the deficit is a success it is an intentional plan because it is part of that long game and so some of these indicators for us can be as you know as small as knowing what my you know if I'm looking just at pollen studio how many new client intakes do we have how many what is the time of the are the projects finishing on time is the profitability rate of those projects where it needs to be that's really what's going to help me you know, tune into if this is working as opposed to, cause I can't, the, if it's working is not the like indicator of the surplus. Um, so there's other things that I'm having to look at to be like, okay, this month we did what we were supposed to do this month. We did, now we did what we were supposed to do the next month. Um, and to just trust that the modeling is right. And it also helps me know at what point, if it's not working, does the modeling need to change? Because I think it is also one of the things I've been fearful of is that the deficit, what if it gets out of control? What if it, um, what if you spend, at what point do you know, like you need to pull the plug on it, it's not working, 
and that's a that's a hard thing it takes um my best friend for deficit managing and deficit is my cash flow you know that's the thing that really helps me at that micro level understand that you know we're making those benchmark increments that we need to be and if you know there was a lot of work we had to do to get the board excited and on the same page about a deficit plan i remember early okay. on board discussions around this budget needs to balance and if we had stayed in that mindset and hadn't been able to evolve out of that pollen would not exist right now because we had to be aggressive and in investing in our growth maintaining the level of our programming keep pushing things out there it's that spend money to make money kind of a thing if we had restricted the size of the organization if i'd laid staff off if we had shrunk to be able to balance the budget i'm so confident that we would not be around anymore right. yeah I, one of the most remarkable things my takeaway is how long you stayed behind the scenes and then could actually roll out with a portfolio of work um, but, but to me that's a huge takeaway and it sounds like it was somewhat organic but also your instincts were to use that run ramp that you had from the foundation to do that. But I just think that's a remarkable and also kind of unexpected takeaway. We often think of these like, ta-da, businesses, we're open, I hope this works. And <laughs> that's not at all what you did. Now, and I would say that's also because you were using a core competence. That's, that's why you could do that. If those other sort of ta-da things, you have to do that because you're sort of starting something brand new, whereas this was a more gradual um, and could be therefore more intentional. So that to me is just a huge process takeaway. Um, so you, but I just want to underscore, you said that foundations and donors have not, you haven't lost one. You haven't had anyone say, oh, now you have your own money. What do you need us for? No, um, we've, there were a lot of eyes on your project. Hmm? Yeah, our contributed philanthropy has grown since we have launched Pollen grown. Studio. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Let's talk a little bit about your role. Because um, I can imagine that it's changed. You, you, you've emphasized in this presentation your expertise is in the artistic and storytelling, et cetera, and that you've acquired and developed the business expertise. How do you spend your time and has that shifted and what's most challenging about having, you know, 50% of your revenue come from this business that's growing successfully but in a complex and long-term way? What does that look like for your role? You know, I think one of the, as I've um, seen other executive directors and friends of mine start to develop their own social enterprise, one of the biggest thing that happens is we underestimate how much time it really does take from us and to recognize that you have two jobs. You're the executive director of the organization. And for me, I'm the director of Pollen Studio. You know, I am, I didn't hire somebody else to develop that program. I'm mm -hmm. developing both of them. And it's two, and they require different um, competencies. They require different expertise. Um, but I have two full-time jobs. It is absolutely not sustainable. And I had to be really clear with myself, like, what is my plan to get out of that? You know, what is my staffing model what does it look like to hire a pollen studio manager somebody that can come in and begin to own that program so it's not always two um, full-time jobs for myself but i think that um, my role in you know at the biggest biggest level like let alone you know being the person that like sells the deals and helps manage the stuff and you know do that kind of stuff that it requires it's hard to get me out of the programming. Like, you know, I'm not a trained executive director. I'm not a finance person. I'm an English major. So it's, it can be hard to, you know, like I always joke that I just got back from maternity leave and it's a great time for the staff to get to do stuff without all my opinions all over the place, you know, because I do love the work so much and I care about the, the quality of the work and I understand the work intimately in every part of it because I am a program person. Um, but you have to, and or if you're going to turn a new competency and you're not going to hire a director of that program, you have to step back and be the one looking at the business. I see myself as that I have to be the holder of the rally cry. I have to make sure that every person on staff and every person on board is ex not only can see the vision, but is excited about it. They can see their role in it because you will absolutely get, you know, moments of grump where I don't want to do the client work. I want to do the, this work. I don't want to do the two things. I want to just do this. Um, and if that's starting to happen, if like grump is starting to happen, it's a great indicator that you are not doing a good job of painting the vision of where the organization is going and how it all works together. You know, if you're not excited about that vision and if you can't make it contagious, then something is broken maybe in how in either the vision or your connection to it. Or I really think that that is ultimately my biggest responsibility. Um, is to make sure that we are all on the same page, staff and board, and that we're excited about it, and we feel like we're collectively building it together. Um, 
And that takes so much energy and thinking and space and check-ins and one-on-one conversations and rally, you know, cheerleading and championing. And it takes a lot of um, interpersonal relationship building. Mm -hmm. I think that's another thing that you, you that's maybe surprising to people about the story, and especially because you keep owning, you know, your background. You could easily see a board saying, yeah, "That's a good idea, but you don't have any experience running a, a business, so we're gonna we must need somebody else, right?" When in fact, again, the model of building on a core confidence would be, "I can build this knowledge with your help, um, but I actually have we have the core confidence <laughs> that let's not go out and fire a business person who doesn't have that core confidence to, to run a studio. Let's bring people around us who can help me." get up to speed with the business, help us get up to speed with the business. I think those are that's a different path than some people might uh, propose to take. Oh, that's you just like nailed it on the head. It's so perfect. We can make stories until we're blue. Like that is what we can do. I can go in, I can hear what your organization is doing and needs and know exactly what is the story opportunity. It's the core competence. And I had to do a lot of soul searching and work to make sure that my board was supporting me on that business side and that I, you know, I signed up and I took finance training. I was in a cohort of other, I met regularly with mentors and peers. I would bring my, I mean, I don't go anywhere without my business plan in my bag. It's in my purse right now. I could pull it out in any meeting and I will be just completely not afraid to be like, what do you think of this? You know, what's your perspective? Trying to just always surround myself with um, people that had you know, I didn't want to, um, I'm very clear about what my strengths are and in investing in my strengths, not trying to invest in my weakness. And I, like, getting this kind of grant and opportunity at 26, also like imposter syndrome is at the foundation of everything that I do. So I'm not, it's just not um, even being invited to do this webinar. It's like, who am I to speak on earned revenue and business models? I'm an English major that loves storytelling. Um, and I have to constantly, you know, remind myself that it's smart people that have helped make up for those other areas. And I'm lucky that I was never, you know, I've had nothing but people reinforce that for me as opposed to say, who are you to do that? Yeah, and that is fortunate, of course, but it's, it's just, there's so many things in your story, uh, Jamie, that I, I hope people are taking away. And I, at least for me, one of the big ones is the thing of building off a of core confidence means that you can start with that optimism, that clarity, you can see it. Even if you haven't done it before, you can see it, you know what clients want, you know whoever the customer is. So there's so much there and then getting the people around you um, who are going to share that optimism but also bring the business savvy that's relevant to your business uh, to board service. So I, I really appreciate you sharing the story. Uh, we're out of time now, uh, but it's been wonderful and certainly you win prettiest slides of any MTQ presentation ever, uh, which would make sense. <laughs> um, and as always, we want to thank you for participating, uh, remind you that we appreciate your support um, as participants in the MTQ community. And I'll also let you know that this is the first of several what we're calling business model bright spots that build on the conversations we had last year during that series, which are still you can still access on our website. The next one we're going to do in June, you'll get an announcement about it is about getting really large with a social justice fundraising context. And we're going to be talking to uh, a vice president of the Community Coalition in South Los Angeles about how they built out their individual giving program, their member program, a capital campaign by staying really place-based and community-based. So that's going to be another business model bright spot coming in June. Jamie, again, thank you so much. And thank you to all who participated in this fabulous discussion.